All right, y'all. Peace and blessings. God bless y'all. I'm Jarvis Kingston, and I hope y'all doing all right, staying strong and solid in these times that room. I pray that you have repented and that you are baptized. I pray that you are safe, protected, and prayed up. And I just pray that whatever situation that you're going through, that the Lord is with you, that he guides you, he protects you, he looks out for you, he comforts you. I pray that you become more strong and wise in the Lord. I pray that your mental health gets better. I pray that you stop backsliding and turn from your ways and get set free and get delivered. And always remember that there is freedom and liberty in Christ, all right? And always seek God's face, always stay on that narrow path, and keep fighting the good fight of faith, and always keep your eyes fixed on the prize, amen? Let's run our race for the Lord, y'all. Yes, yes, y'all. Let us thank the Lord for another day. Let us be grateful for food in our belly, clothes on our back, a roof over our head. Let us thank the Lord for protecting us coming in and coming out. Yes, yes, y'all. Let us make sure that we have no unforgiveness in our hearts. Let us make sure that we make peace with everybody as possible. And let us keep it moving forward and be stronger people day by day. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Gotta appreciate things better to take it one day at a time, okay? Yes, yes. Greetings, body of Christ. Shalom, everybody. What is going on? What is going on with you all? Thank you all for supporting. Thank you all for listening. I truly appreciate all of you. I love you all. Praying for you all. Just hoping that things get better for all of us. All right? It will get better. All right, have to go through those trials and tribulations, those hardships and those challenges and obstacles, but we will prevail. We will conquer because we do serve the conqueror. Amen. He overcame the world, so let us have joy and rejoice. All right, count it all joy. Let us overcome everything that stands in our way. Any stumbling block, any resistance, anything, you know, let us defeat it, overcome it, and let us walk in the power of God that he gave us. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Welcome everybody, all nations, all peoples, all tribes, all languages, all tongues, all races, all faces, all four corners of the earth. Whether you are an Israelite or a Gentile, it is all right. Whether you are chosen or adopted, it is all right. Let us gather, let us praise the Lord, let us rejoice, and let us just keep uplifting one another, strengthening one another, encouraging one another. And iron sharpens iron, correction, edification, and much love with a joy and a merry heart as well. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. The spiritual warfare is getting intense, so much going on all over the world, but we have to be firm and steadfast to stay in alignment, okay? Let us love the Lord our God with all of our mind, heart, and soul. Let us love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Let us obey the gospel. Let us obey the law, statutes, and commandments. Let us obey his word all the way and not just be hearers of the world, but of the word, but let us be doers of the word. Amen. Let us be doers, okay? Let us practice the things that are in the scriptures. Let us exercise it and walk in the authority that the Lord has given us, okay? The Lord is the father of lights. He is the father of all good gifts. All good gifts come from him, okay? So let us embrace that and thank him for that, all right? Keep seeking the Lord for wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, all right? For healing, restoration, interpretation, all that belongs to the Lord, amen? So let us always keep in mind of that, all right? I hope that you all having a blessed day today. You know, I hope that you all are taking it one day at a time, all right? Just hang in there, okay? Hang in there. All right, all right. So today's message, we're going to continue our Bible reading series, okay? We finished off the book of Matthew last night with the reading of Matthew chapter 25 through 28. Now we are officially in the book of Mark, okay? So we're going to go through the book of Mark, and then from there, we'll close out with the priestly blessing. We'll close out with a prayer, and we'll also close out with giving all the praise, honor, and glory to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and praise His only begotten Son who died for our sins. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So let us go to the book of Mark. So before we get into Mark chapter one, we will read the commentary that is right before it to give us a little introduction of this book and everything and then go from there. OK, so let us start off with the commentary of the book of Mark. Arthur John Mark or Evangelist Mark, audience, Christian Gentiles in Rome. Date probably between A.D. 55 and 65. Setting, Mark most likely writes from Rome. According to early church sources, Mark receives the information for his gospel from the Apostle Peter. Essentials of Mark. All right, all right, Essentials of Mark. The gospel of Mark provides a sense of all action all the time. From the beginning, we find Jesus on the move, giving us a good idea of the hectic pace during the three years of his ministry. Mark focuses squarely on Jesus and his never serving, never swerving purposes. We approach Mark's gospel struggling with our own double booked schedules and frantic lifestyles. Yet Mark somehow keeps pace with us and at the same, and at the same time helps us slow down. As you read the gospel of Mark, look for insights into Jesus' life. 
Despite the turbulence around him, Jesus calms the hearts of men as well as the waves of the sea. He quiets winds, banishes demons, and forgives sins. In short, Jesus is man doing things only God can do. What to look for in Mark. Examples of the true meaning of service. An answer to our longing for forgiveness. Stolen moments of devotion during fast-paced days. The wild side of following Jesus. The cross as God's greatest example of love and service. All right, all right, y'all. So that's the introduction commentary of the book of Mark. Now let us get into the book of Mark, chapter 1. Here we go. John the Baptist prepares the way. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The baptism and temptation of Jesus. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the, in the Jordan River. As Jesus was coming up out of the water and he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love with you. I am well pleased at once. The spirit sent him out into the desert and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. The calling of the first disciples. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, for the further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Jesus drives out an evil spirit. They went to Capernaum, Capernaum and, when the, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were also amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Jesus heals many. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. So when he, so he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. Diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Jesus prays in a solitary place. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. 
I am willing. He said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. <laughs> as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. All right. So that's the book of Mark chapter one reading. And it goes into a review of the same um, the same accounts that Matthew was having about Jesus and how he went about his journey. Mark is having the same is repeated as well in the book of Mark chapter one. So it kind of sums up everything squeezed in Matthew one. All right. So um, it's just amazing to see him healing and casting out and just walking in that power of God as we should. Amen. Jesus was the example and the standard that we have to follow the example of the standard. All right. So what I would love to do is read these in commentary scripture right within the book of Mark chapter one reading, which is titled God is full of compassion. It's the book of Mark chapter one, verse 41 filled with compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. He said, be clean. All right. Now I would like to read the other commentary within the book of Mark chapter one. Okay. All right, let's go. The journey day one, Simon Peter, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. No, my beloved, I do not know where he will take us. Not far, I imagine, to the villages of our people nearby. To Jerusalem at times, perhaps, but not to the ends of the earth. Yes, Andrew is going too, and James and John. We have all talked it over. The fish can catch themselves for a while without us and sell themselves too. I meant that to make you smile, beloved. Please do not fear. Our workers know what to do, and we will be back often. You will be all right. And just think, he told us we would be catching men now, not fish. Oh, it's clear enough what he meant by that. These are important days. We have felt so for a long time. John said so too. The other John, I mean John the Baptist, when we went to the river to see him, he said the kingdom was near and he was clearing the road so the Lord could come. Jesus was there too. He and John are relatives and half the Judean countryside was there. We have a chance to be among these men, not just as fish among fish, but as fishermen among fish. Danger? No. Excuse me. I do not expect danger. God will deliver us. But if it comes to that, my sword is ready. I will not fear to strike a blow. Let the Lord's enemies be beware of me. Yes, yes, you are right. There is much I do not know about this man, but I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to do. May God guide my learning and doing. Back to the future. Many of us, like Peter, knew a time in our life that was before Christ when we had a little idea like Peter where Jesus would lead us or what he would require of us. During the time you have followed Christ, how have you changed? How are you changing still? Not only your beliefs, but also in your behaviors, your priorities, your values, your career goals, your circle of friends, and the things that define you as a person. How would you respond to the question? You call yourself a follower of Christ, but where is Christ taking you? Hmm. The story continues to call of the disciples, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. The book of John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. Peter's Confession, the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Peter's Denial, the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses 27 through 72. The book of Peter's Reconciliation, the book of John, chapter 21. Peter's Sermon, the book of Acts, chapter 2. Peter's Wisdom, first Peter reading. All right, so that's just the commentary based around Mark, chapter 1, based around Simon Peter and the disciples as well, okay? Now, let us get into the book of Mark, chapter 2, all right? The book of Mark, chapter 2, here we go. Jesus heals a paralytic, a paralytic, paralytic. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic. 
carried by four of them. Since they, had, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things, which is easy to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in a full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Excuse me. The calling of Levi. Once again, Jesus went outside, went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, Alphaeus sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Hmm. Jesus questioned about fasting. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so as long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch on unshrunk cloth, clothes on, on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. Lord of the Sabbath, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some, he pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Yes, yes. All right. So that's the book of Mark chapter 2 reading. All right. So the book of Mark chapter 2 reading, it starts off with Jesus healing the person who was paralyzed. And I love this story and this, this one so much because these group of men, it was so much people in the, in the, in the place. It was so crowded. They went up top of the roof and ripped it all off just to get that healing from Jesus. That's the amazing type of faith we need to have when it comes to seeking God, to seek his face, to seek his glory, to seek his power, to seek his will. We got to have that type of faith, that type of approach to tear off a roof just to get the things of God, to, to, to by any means necessary to get that healing, get that restoration, get that deliverance, get that prayer answered, whatever. That's the type of faith we have to have. And that's very beautiful. I love reading Mark chapter two because um, we could truly apply that, apply that to our lives. You know, it's no need to walk around in doubt and, and, and uncertainty. There's, there's everything got to be done by faith, people. You can't doubt the power of God. You can't doubt his word. You can't doubt anything of God, man. Everything's about believing in faith and actionizing it. Faith without works is dead, people. The people believed that the paralyzed person could get healed, so they went on top of that roof, tore it up to get that healing. Amen. Jesus was impressed and loved that type of faith. So that's the type of pray that's the type of faith and approach we have to have. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. And as we go through Mark chapter two, he deals with calling Levi to follow him. And also is dealing with him eating with tax collectors and sinners, deal with the Pharisees. And I love when Jesus said, 
the health it's not the healthy who needs a doctor but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. So I love when he says that, you know what I mean? It's not a time period to look down on people and all that. It's not the time for that, okay? So always keep that in mind, all right? And also, um, Jesus was questioned about fasting and traditions and, you know, things of nature, dealing with the Pharisees once again. And the Lord reminded that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, things of that nature, all right? So that sums up the book of Mark chapter 2. What I would love to do before I get to the book of Mark chapter 3, I would love to read this commentary that's based on the book of Mark chapter 2, okay? So here we go. Today's Bible reading, the book of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Recommended reading, the book of Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. The book of Mark chapter 5, verses 24 through 34. The book of Luke chapter 5, verses 19 through 26. Unstoppable Faith is the title of this commentary, Unstoppable Faith. On Monday, April 13th, 1970, the crew members of Apollo 13 found themselves marooned 200,000 miles from Earth. During a routine maintenance task, one of the spacecraft's four oxygen tanks exploded. For the next four days, astronauts Jim Lavelle, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes worked against all odds to bring their wounded ship back to Earth. People around the world prayed for the trio's safe return. Each time the engineers at NASA solved one problem, another, another took its place, but a little faith and a lot of sweat eventually worked wonders. And after four long days, Apollo 13's parachutes opened to lower the spacecraft's safety safely into the Pacific Ocean. NASA's astronauts and engineers put their faith in science and engineering and maybe in an emergency to cry to God for help. Nearly 2,000 years later, two, two, 2,000 years earlier, four friends of a paralyzed man demonstrated simple and sincere faith in God. Think of what they did. They carried their disabled friend for miles, destroyed part of a total stranger's roof, and risked the possible wrath of an angry Jesus. But amazingly, when Jesus saw their unshakable faith, he said to the stricken man, son, your sins are forgiven. Verse five. What about your faith? And what areas of your life would an extra measure of faith make you closer to the man God calls you to be? Lower yourself before Christ. Ask him to give you simple, sincere, unstoppable faith things to take away. What do you think Jesus would say to you about the depth of your faith? How does your faith affect your thoughts and actions? And what ways can you demonstrate an unrelenting faith at home and at work during the next few weeks? In other words, all that I have seen teaches me to trust the creator for all I have not seen. Ralph Waldo Emerson, quote, so that is the commentary in between the book of Mark chapter two, Unstoppable Faith, just bringing up a little story mentioned in NASA. I know everybody has different views and opinions about that, but we're just going through these commentaries as they are. All right. So just unstoppable faith, people. The same way these men traveled a long distance and brought their paralyzed friend and tore off the roof for them to get healed. We got to have that same approach when it comes to the things of God. Having that faith, if he, heal, he will turn it around, he will do it for us. Okay. Many of us have walked long distances to chase the things of God. We have went through so much of a journey and path to seek God's face and the things that he has in store for us, okay? We're not here just to be left here, amen? God will get us through and God will come through. He will deliver, amen? In due timing and his timing, amen? Always believe that, people, all right? So that's the sum up of the book of Mark chapter two reading. Now let's go into the book of Mark chapter three, all right? The book of Mark chapter three, here we go. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herod, Herod, Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Crowds followed Jesus. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him 
to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forth to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Hmm. The appointing of the twelve apostles. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those, those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James son of Zebedee, and his brother John to them he gave the name Boanerges, Boan, Nerges, Nerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, Iscariot, who betrayed him, Jesus and Beelzebub. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables, How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Mm. Jesus' mother and brothers. And Jesus' mothers and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in, and they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, "Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you." Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated, seated in a circle around him and said, "Here are my mother and my brothers." Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Mm. So that's the book of Mark, chapter three, reading. All right. And it just goes through a review of, you know, the crowds constantly following Jesus and how much they needed him to touch him and to get healed by him. Also, it also discusses about Jesus healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath in the synagogue and also teaching and walking in the power of God. Also, when you see Jesus walking, his his power is so amazing that the demons cried out to him. Those spirits, those evil spirits were having full conversations with Jesus, de declaring who he is, proclaiming who he is, saying he is the son of God. So even evil spirits, demons even know who you are in the spiritual warfare. They can even know who's a real man of the most high. All right. They knew it just by seeing him. All right. And this also goes further into Jesus appointing the 12 disciples, 12 apostles, and then it goes into Jesus uh, proving the Pharisees even wrong. And the Pharisees thought he had an evil spirit, but he had the Holy Spirit and they blasphemed. And he was telling them about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, how it's unforgivable. And then Jesus goes more further again also into his physical carnal family and his spiritual family. And he's basically saying your physical family that's born by blood, that's not your real family. Your spiritual family, whoever does the will of God, that's your family. So Jesus declared that and establish that all right amen so that's the book of mark chapter 3 reading now we will go into the book of mark chapter 4 reading all right the book of mark chapter 4 here we go all right mark 4 the parable of the sower again jesus began to teach by the lake the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it on the lake sat in out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. 
and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked of him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never per- perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed down on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of other things come and choke the word, making it unfruitful. You know, the cares of the world. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it and produce a crop 30, 60 or even 100 times what was sown. A lamp on a stand. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. The parable of the growing seed. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as... The grain is ripe. He puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. The parable of the mustard seed. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them. As much as they could understand, he did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Jesus calms the storm. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Hmm. So that's the book of Mark, chapter four reading. All right. Beautiful read. Okay, and I just want to read this in commentary scripture quote within Mark four, Mark, chapter four, verse thirty nine. He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. God overpowers nature. Yes, yes, y'all. So the book of Mark, chapter four is a great read, a great read and everything squeezed in talks about the parable of the sower, putting a lamp on a stand, everything being brought to light, the parable of the growing seed, all right, the parable of the mustard seed, and also Jesus calming the storm, all right, whatever storm you're going through, just know Jesus will calm it, amen, that faith gives you that stability, and being firm and steadfast, amen, amen, excuse me, so, what I would like to do before we get into the book of Mark chapter 5, I would like to read the in commentary, 
this commentary within Mark chapter 4, okay? T today's Bible reading, the book of Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Recommended reading, the book of Psalm 69, verses 1 through 36. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 11. The book of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Also, Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. The book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 18 through 23. And the title of this commentary is called, Who Is This? Maybe you've seen that infamous video of a cameraman and a reporter rushing under the girders of a bridge to ride out a tornado. Just watching the, port the power of that tornado makes you grateful you've never experienced such a wild storm yourself. When an unexpected wild storm whipped across the Sea of Galilee, the disciples seemed certain they'd sink to the bottom of the lake. But then Jesus rose from his place in the boat and with the word brought stillness and calm. The men who had feared drowning suddenly experienced a different kind of fear. They had to face the question, who is this? Verse 41, Jesus often placed people in a position of having to decide about him. After asking his disciples what other people said about him, Jesus posed the direct question, who do you say I am? Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. When John the Baptist sent two of his followers to inquire about Jesus' identity, Jesus sent the messengers back with the directive, report to John what you have seen and heard. Book of Luke chapter 7, verse 22. When Jesus forgave a man's sin, shocked religious leaders exclaimed, who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Of course, they understood precisely the, rev the ramifications of the answer. Now they had to decide about Jesus. So must we. In fact, life hinges on our decision about Jesus. We still face wild storms and overwhelming questions. But when we link our lives together with his, we find a place of safety within which we can withstand the storms. When we decide to follow Jesus, we take our stand on much more than an issue of philosophy or history. We're not deciding which side to take in some endlessly boring and meaningless religious debate. Rather, in that moment, we set the overall, cor overall course of our lives, as well as determine how we are to live each day. Deciding for Jesus provides meaning that, our replacing, me meaning that replaces our emptiness. Deciding for Jesus provides meaning that replaces our emptiness. The choice enables us to serve others selflessly instead of continuously seeking self-gratification. It allows us to live joyfully instead of avoiding times of trial and despair. And ultimately, a decision for Jesus gives us life instead of death. Things to take away from this commentary. How would you react if someone with whom you traveled were to calm a storm? How did your life change when you began following Jesus? How would you answer the question, who do you say that Jesus is? Hmm. Very excellent commentary right there. Something to truly reflect on. Amen. So I love about reading the Bible. When you actually read the Bible, it actually reads you. Mm -hmm. Always goes back to your outlook, your faith, your mindset, your approach, your attitude, your behaviors, your lifestyle. The word really reads you. So let us always evaluate our everyday life and ask ourselves, are we aligned with the word? Are we aligned by his promises? Are we living a life that reflects his love? Amen. So that was the book of Mark chapter four, reading and commentary. Now let us go to the book of Mark chapter five. All right. The book of Mark chapter five. Here we go. All right. The healing, the healing of a demon possessed man. Mark five. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Gerasenes, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained in hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When Jesus, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion. He replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. 
A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went, it, and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Mm. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Mm. A dead girl and a sick woman. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus, Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Mm. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, touched his garment, because she because she thought if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Mm. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in there. The child and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Koum, Talitha Koum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Mm, that's the book of Mark chapter five reading right there. Okay. All right, so as we preview math, as we review uh, Matthew five reading, it goes in detail about the healing of the demon possessed man, and how Jesus changed his life and amazed everybody, and how the man was in his right mind and dressed well, and what have you. All right, and that's the thing because when you go around today, right, when you go to different parts of a city, especially like the hood or downtown part of a city. You know, you always like kind of catch those people like some people call them poor, homeless or uh, strung out. People have different names and terms to go by. But at the end of the day, a lot of times when you see those type of people out on the street, on a corner, uh, you know, like talking to themselves or loud, cussing, what have you. You, you know, a lot of times um, those are spirits. Those are demons. You know, those are evil spirits that they have on them. You know what I mean? So you have to heal people. You have to. Lay hands on them, man. You know what I mean? You got to pray for these people out here because so much of that more than ever when you just go outside these downtown parts of a city. So we have to truly walk in that power of God and that authority in his son's name and by the blood to really uh, cast out them unclean spirits and to heal these people and recover them and restore them by God's power, by his son's name. Because 
there's just way too much of that more than ever. You know, it's like right after COVID, um, you start to see more and more of that, like heavy. Like you'll be driving on the highway, expressway or interstate or whatever, and you'll see them like on the corner. You know, you see them by the plaza or somewhere in the street. And we got to reach out to these people and heal these people. You know what I'm saying? So the power of God needs to be more evident out here, all right? So as we go through Matthew chapter 5, it also goes into detail about Jesus healing the girl and the sick woman, the woman touching his garment. And then she was healed just by the touch of it, her faith. And Jesus was very pleased with her faith. All right. And let's see as we go through 5. Um, it's the interesting part about the book of Mark chapter 5 reading was like one of the last parts when he was healing the dead girl. Uh, he brought her back to life. The term that he said was Talitha Kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. So that's an interesting term, Talitha Kum. Talitha Kum, all right? So that's a term we got to go by if we're going to heal a young girl, okay? All right, Talaka, Talitha Kum. All right, let us use that, all right? So what I would like to do before we get to the book of Mark chapter 6, I would like to read the commentary that's included within the book of Mark chapter 5, okay? So let's go through this commentary. Today's Bible reading, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Recommended reading, Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. The book of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The book of Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 17. All right, so the title of this commentary is called Beggars can be choosers. When the son of the most high God bursts onto the scene, everyone becomes a beggar. Given his unparalleled power and authority, there is no other option. Notice that there are three kinds of beggars in this story. When Jesus gets out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit approaches from the tombs to meet him. Verse 2, he runs and then falls on his knees before Jesus the legion of demons inside him crying out for mercy. The demons implore Jesus not to send them away. Verse 10, the spirits would have overpowered Jesus if they could have, but it is significant that they didn't even try. Their begging testifies to Jesus' incredible authority. They were pleading from a position of weakness. After witnessing Jesus casting the evil spirits from this man, those tending the pigs run off to give a report in the town or countryside. The people who hear the report from the herdsmen beg Jesus to depart from their region. Verse 17. The text uh, speci- specifies that they were afraid. Verse 15. These people were begging from fear. There is one more beggar in this story. The man who had a demon possessed and treats Jesus for permission to go with him. Verse 18. It is clear why he wants to go. Jesus had just healed him from his hor- horrific tormentors. The man's begging demonstrates Jesus' surpassing worth. This beggar pleads from longing and reverent, reverence, reverence for Jesus. When Jesus bursts onto the scene again, he will again make everyone a beggar. The question for us is not, will I be a beggar, but what kind of beggar will I be? Will you be one who begs God to destroy you? Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, or someone who begs him to show you more of his glory. You see, in this case, beggars can be choosers. Things to take away. How would you respond to someone who asked, what has Jesus done for you? In what ways does your life demonstrate the worth of Jesus? What steps can you take to prepare for the day when Jesus burst onto the scene once again? In other words, No man in the world can have endured 10 years without having begged God to forgive him. William Saroyan. Hmm. Excellent commentary. Something to reflect on, okay? Beggars can be choosers. Them demons, them unclean spirits, them evil spirits, they begged Jesus about the authority and that power. They begged him. All right, so it's an interesting read, okay? Now we are doing Mark chapter 5. Let us go into the book of Mark chapter 6. All right. The book of Mark chapter 6. Here we go. A prophet without honor. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked, what's this wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, 
Judas and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his home, in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Hmm. Jesus sends out the twelve. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two, two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. John the Baptist beheaded. King Herod heard about this for Jesus' name had been became become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John the Baptist, man, I beheaded has been raised from the dead for Herod. Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, 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 his brother, Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came on his birthday. Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came and and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guest. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. Mm. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Mm, mm, mm. Jesus feeds the 5,000. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leave and recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he said, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of man's weight of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. And Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Jesus walks on water. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him in Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. 
When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Genesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. To wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. All right, all right. So that's the book of Mark, chapter 6, reading. I would like to read this in commentary scripture within Mark 6. God does value rest. The book of Mark, chapter 6, verse 31. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. That's beautiful because in this journey, in the spiritual warfare, putting in the works, you do get very weary and tired. But we know Galatians says, do not be weary. Um, do not, you know, do not be weary and growing and, go, and doing good because in due season we will get a reward and we will reap and rejoice or what have you. But the work was so intense of casting out and healing and preaching we got to remember, these people are outside on their feet like all day long. They was in the hot sun doing this stuff. So it's not like they had the type of transportation we have where we got a car and we could be in, in a nice house, and AC, doing this stuff. You know, these people are outside in the sun and all types of weather conditions doing this stuff. You know, going across the sea, going across the land, you know. So they, these people, the work was serious. It's old school. So it's really old school on how they traveled and transported, you know, so... It was a lot of work and God valued their rest. Amen. So God will give you that sure rest when you feel overwhelmed or tired. He will give you that rest. Amen. He will give you that sweet sleep. All right. Because this world, the ways of this world likes to overwork us. And when we do these jobs and these carnal things and these environments, they like to overwork us and not care about days off and pay time off or what have you, vacations, you know. But God cares about our rest. He does value it. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So as we review Mark chapter 6. Jesus goes talking about how a prophet is not honored in his own hometown or his countryside. He also goes about um, sending out the 12 disciples and giving them the instructions on, you know, on how to go about their journey and how to deal with people who accept them or don't accept them, um, you know, to preach and to have authority over evil spirits. OK, and then it also goes into talking about how John the Baptist was beheaded. You know, what I mean. And Jesus feeding the 5,000 people and Jesus walking on water. All right. So that's a summary of Mark chapter six. OK, now what I'd like to do is go to the book of Mark chapter seven. All right. We will go into the book of Mark chapter seven. Here we go. Clean and unclean. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean. That is unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but, rule, but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Hmm. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might observe have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift devoted to God, then you have no longer than 
you have no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out of his body. And saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of a man's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Mm. The faith of the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. 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 She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. The healing of a deaf and mute man. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre, Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the book of Mark, chapter 7 reading, all right? As we review the book of Mark, chapter 7, Jesus deciphers, he distinguishes what really makes a person clean and unclean and not just tradition of men of food, but what's out of a person's heart, the attitudes, their behaviors, their actions. That would dictate whether a person is clean or unclean. Uh, right. Then he goes more further into um, healing the foreign woman. All right. The, the Syrian woman. And then he also goes further into healing the deaf and mute man. All right, which is so amazing and beautiful when you see the power of God just flowing through healing and restoration and happiness and amazement and joy. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So that wraps up the book of Mark chapter 7 reading. What I would love to do before we get into Mark chapter 8, I would just like to read this commentary that was within these pages. Okay, so let's go to the commentary. Okay, today's Bible reading, Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 56. Recommended reading. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 through 13, Psalm 42, verses 1 through 7, also Psalm 46, verse 10, the book of John chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. The title of this commentary is called A Lone Ranger. What do you do to stay in shape? Hit the gym every morning, strap on your Nikes and run a few miles, bike to work. Interestingly, we live in a world that encourages men to take to make their bodies strong but neglect their spirits. Mm. As a result, we too often work to build up our biceps but completely ignore our souls. We typically think of masculine strength as physical. But what if true strength comes from inside, from your soul and its connection to God? When was the last time you worked out to strengthen that part of your being? Mm. Most of us know the stories of Jesus walking on water and feeding thousands. 
but we easily gloss over the way Jesus sought solitude to build up his spiritual strength. Yes, even Jesus needed to rest and renew. In fact, Jesus established a rhythm. He engaged and then disengaged. He served and then he withdrew. And who's quiet? In those quiet times, Jesus took care of his soul by connecting with God and drawing life from him. If Jesus demonstrated the importance of withdrawing into solitude, how much more do we need to set aside times of respite in our own lives? Of course, our culture doesn't help. Life moves so quickly that we can forget to tend to our souls. We forget to tend our souls. But if you ignore your soul or pretend that you don't have one, you'll face problems. Just as your body sends you all kinds of uncomfortable signals when you neglect it physically, so will your soul. Obsessions, irritations, addictions, broken relationships, often these trouble point to a neglected soul. Take time to be alone and make yourself utterly available only to yourself and to God. Connect with him. And in doing so, take care of your soul. Mm, It's a beautiful commentary right there. That one hit me right there. I hope it hit y'all too. Things to take away from this commentary. What do you tend to do when you are really stressed out? Are these activities more like escape mechanisms or do they feed your soul and connect you to God? What signals does your soul send you when you neglect its care? Where can you go to be alone with God? When? Make a list of places and times you can exercise the habit of connecting with him. Beautiful commentary, y'all. Yes, yes, we definitely need to always take care of our souls, man. Got to take care of it, people. We live in such a carnal, external world. We live in such a superficial, materialistic world. People forget the inside things matter. Jesus mostly preached about the inside, man. Inside the mind, inside the heart, inside the soul. You get what I'm saying? It's the inside that matters, man. And people keep neglecting it. All right, so let us work on that daily. Let's better ourselves in those areas of our lives. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So that's the overall reading commentary and the overall reading of Mark chapter 7, okay? Now we will go into the book of Mark chapter 8. The book of Mark chapter 8, here we go. Jesus feeds the 4,000. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present and having sent them away. He got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it it is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? (laughs) Now, let us keep continuing. The healing of a blind man at Bethsaida. They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. 
Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Peter's Confession of Christ. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Mm. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can, a, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in the adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes into come in his father's glory with the holy angels. All right. So that's the book of Mark chapter 8 reading right there. Very, very, very powerful. All right. So it just goes more into Jesus feeding the thousands of people. All right. It also goes further about Jesus warning about the Pharisees and Herod. How the bread of God, the bread of life, the word is more important and fruitful than anything in life. How God can multiply and double things, triple things and abundant things for you. But be aware of Pharisees and Herod because them people who all they do is take and kill. And they can't be fruitful or multiply anything. That's what Jesus is getting through them. Also, the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. Jesus restoring his sight and fixing it. Peter's confession of Christ when they when Jesus asked the disciples to test them saying who you think I am they were all getting different names and suggestions as John the Baptist Elijah the other prophets Jeremiah what have you but uh, the reason why all those names and similarities kept popping up because they all had similar powers they had similar teachings doctrines they had similar walks of life but they all served the same God but it's like a whole family a whole lineage a whole patriarch of men having similar things in the things of God, but Christ is the true, true son of the most high, and he is the true one that sits at the right hand of God. Amen. So Christ just wanted to always establish that and be circumspect about how he was going about it as well, because uh, he was very meek and humble and didn't want to be vain about his position and who he was. Amen. Because he wasn't doing it for the validation of man. He was doing it to please the Lord. That's how we have to live our lives. Okay. We can't get caught up in positions and titles and things of that nature. We have to always serve God and make God happy through everything in our life, regardless of our status, rich, poor, famous, unfamous, don't matter. Keep serving God and uh, please the Lord through it. Amen. So that's the message Christ was really getting at through his disciples and what have you. Okay. And also Jesus predicting his death as well, fulfilling prophecy and things of that nature. All right. So that sums up the book of Mark chapter eight reading. Now we will go into the book of Mark chapter nine. All right. The book of Mark chapter 9, here we go. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. The transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us up there. Let us let us let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone except with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man 
had risen from the dead, they kept the matter to themselves discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the son of man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. The healing of a boy with an evil spirit. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who was possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked for I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has, the, has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this can only come out by fasting and prayer. Mm. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Who is the greatest? They came to Capernaum. Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them, taking him in his arms. He said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Whoever is not against us is for us. All right, all right. Whoever is not against us is for us. Teacher said, John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. Will not lose his reward. Mm -hmm. Causing the sin. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, it loses its flavor. How can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. All right. All right. So that's the book of Mark chapter 10 reading. So it discusses again the transfiguration process. Jesus healing the boy with an evil spirit. The argument of who was the greatest within the kingdom. And Jesus describing the little child and accepting the ch little children as the kingdom and how the kingdom belongs to them. 
And the part of the book of Mark chapter uh, 9 I love the most is the book of Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. I really love that part a lot where it says, Teacher said, John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And also further in the book of Mark chapter 9 discusses about um, not causing little children to sin, all right, and helping the children stay upright, amen, and how serious uh, hell is for those who uh, keep doing wrong, all right, all right. And also Jesus talks about salt and how good it is, but if it loses its flavor, what use is it? There's no worth to it, all right? And he says to have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. That part right there when it says, um, for whoever's not against us is with us, is a very important thing because remember, when when John saw this, most likely the person casting out a demon in Jesus' name, pr most likely probably wasn't an Israelite or wasn't a Hebrew. So that's probably why John had a problem with it. And when it comes to the New Covenant, the New Testament, the Lord is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh to where your sons and daughters will prophesy, right? So all four corners of the earth, you're going to see all types of people doing the works of God, doing the miracles. You're going to see black people, white people, Latino, Asian. It's going to be all different looking people with the Holy Spirit casting out demons, laying the hands on the sick, doing the things of the power of God. All right. When God gives someone his gifts or his power, um, there's no limit to it. You get what I'm saying? Like we are people are prejudiced, but not the most high. All right. The most high looks at the hearts, not appearance. John was hung up on appearance. And Jesus had to let him know, like, hey, if no one, if someone's not against us, they're for us. You know, we're all on the same team. We may look a little different, but we're all we're all the same. We're serving the same God. So that's what Jesus was expressing to John, because they were so used to just seeing only themselves doing it as disciples and seeing only just Hebrew Israelites doing it. I mean, being seeing Israelites do it, but there's going to be those outside of Israel. There's going to be those who are not Israelites also doing it too. And Jesus was just bringing them into that, like get out of the spirit of division, get out of the prejudice spirit, get out of that stigma. You get what I'm saying? Because um, we're all going to be glorified with him at the, when it's all said and done, right? We're going to be all glorified with him as Revelation talks about. It says all nations, all tribes, all languages, all peoples, all tongues, all four corners of the earth. There's going to be all looking people being glorified with him. So we, we, we can't have that, that prejudice spirit, that division spirit. We can't have that. Um, because who God is, God can use anybody. God will use, of course, his own with Israel. He'll also use a Latino person, Latina. He'll use a, a Asian. He'll, he'll, he'll use any person who is willing to be used by him, who is able to be obedient and faithful and in alignment, all right? Let us not get hung up on looks, all right? Because, hey, man, we, this, this, it's a team, man. It's a body of Christ, man. It's just a kingdom, bro. It's not just some, like, isolation prejudice thing man this uh this 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 all four corners of the earth thing is a powerful thing all right so we have to get out of our own way when it comes to looking at another person's appearance or differences or what have you um god is no respecter of persons all right so always keep that in mind so that was the book of mark chapter 9 reading amen now we will go into the book of mark chapter 10 all right the book of mark chapter 10 here we go all right, the book of Mark, chapter 10, divorce. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus replied, but at the beginning of creation of God, made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Mm. The little children and Jesus. 
People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was angry. He said to them, let the children, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Mm. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them and blessed them. The rich young man, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimonies, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. At this, is, at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Whew. Wow. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields and with them persecutions. And in this age to come eternal life, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Jesus again predicts his death. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished. While those who followed were afraid, again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Excuse me, the request of James and John. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, teacher. They said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in, gl in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I, I drink and be baptized with the baptism with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they became very angry with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Blind Baratimaeus receives his sight. Bartimaeus receives his sight. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with the large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of, Na Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus st stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the book of Mark chapter 10 reading. All right. And it goes more further in the detail of 
Let's see. The divorce, she's discussing about divorces and adultery. Uh, the children, the little children of Jesus coming to Jesus for prayer and wanting to be blessed. And Jesus saying you have to walk into the kingdom as a child. Um, Jesus also uh, using that parable against a young rich man. All right. Talking about how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. All right. And Jesus also predicts his death, his death again. And James, Jesus also dealt with James and John, how the disciples were all angry at them for that question and things of that nature. And Jesus reminding us that he came to serve. All right. So we're here to serve people we're here to serve, not be served. All right. And uh, Jesus also bl um, blessing a blind person and making that person see. Amen. Yes. Yes. So that's the book of Mark, chapter 10. Before I go into the book of Mark, chapter 11, I would like to read the commentary that is included within these pages and advance on. Today's Bible reading. Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Recommended reading, the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 through 27. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. The book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. First, serve. When was the last time you volunteered to do something in service to another person? If you're a father... You've probably done something selfless already to serve your child or children today. If you're a husband, chances are you can remember the last time you served your wife without her asking. But if you're a single guy in your first job, scrapping together a living and trying to make ends meet, it's possible that it's been a while. Most of us know that most of us know we should serve others, but we don't really know how. Talking about serving is a lot easier than actually doing it. Jesus served throughout his ministry. When he served others, the act often involved self-sacrifice. Ultimately, he sacrificed his life for our sins. When we serve others, he especially those who have no way of repaying us. We in imitate Jesus. We represent Christ to those we serve. Kenneth Leach writes, Christian spirituality is the spirituality of the poor man of Nazareth who took upon himself the form of a servant to follow the way of the kingdom is therefore to follow him who fed the hungry, healed the sick, befriended the outcast, and blessed the peacemakers. Even with Jesus living and serving right in front of them, the disciples didn't seem to get it. They wondered how could how they could be great. But Jesus answered, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Mm. That's the paradox of servant. When we give ourselves away in service, we find ourselves. When we empty ourselves in service, we find fulfillment. A lot of people search for identity and self-fulfillment. Most look for it in repeated highs of promotions, exotic vacations, or endless parade of worldly possessions. But real fulfillment comes from serving God by serving others. When we give ourselves away in service to others, we find meaning and joy in life that selfishness can never equal. Things to take away. What opportunities do what opportunities do you have to serve others, even people who can't ever repay you? What small and practical acts of service can you do at work or in your neighborhood to serve others? What steps can you take to cultivate a selfless and humble heart of service? In other words, I would never want to reach out someday with a soft, uncaloused hand. A hand never dirtied by serving and shake the nail pierced hand of Jesus. Bill Hybels. Mm, powerful, powerful commentary right there. Got to be serving, y'all. Serving. A lot of people have that entitlement and become a narcissist and always have that what's in it for me and why I got to do this, why I got to do that. See, people who are um, stuck in their ways have that mindset and approach. That's why people with that attitude can't serve God thoroughly. Um, the prophets, Christ, the disciples, the apostles, they were all serving people. They were all serving all throughout their life. Even when sometimes it didn't make sense or add up, they still did it. You know, you got to understand the things that the, all these men of the Lord been through to lead to where we are today. Amen. Jesus said he came to serve. Yes, yes. So do not walk around being haughty and big headed. There's no room for that in the kingdom. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Yes, yes. So that is the book of Mark chapter 10 reading. All right. Now, before I go into Mark 11, just had to repeat 
the book, the, the commentary, the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45. Jesus came to serve for even even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's always remind ourselves to serve, man. All right. Yes, yes, y'all. So now let's get into the book of Mark, chapter 11, the triumphal entry. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Beth, Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're doing this, tell them the Lord needs it and they will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered the Jerusalem and went to the temple. He went to the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Jesus clears the temple. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf. He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. The withered fig tree. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand in prayer, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Mm -hmm. The authority of Jesus questioned. They arrived in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked, and who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, they will, they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. <laughs> yes, yes. That's the book of Mark chapter 11. Yes, yes. Got to humble people, amen. Those scoffers and sarcastic people and... You know, just, you know, you got to humble them. Right. So when we review, when we review the book of Mark, chapter 11, it talks about Jesus pulling up to Jerusalem. He pulled up on the donkey, on the colt and untied it, things of that nature. And they're praising him, having a celebration, a uh, feast over it. And then it discusses more about Jesus clearing the temple and flipping the tables and what have you and his anger being showed. Because the house will be a house of prayer for all nations. It shouldn't be a, a place of dens of robbers. So Jesus was very angry about that and how they were going about things. All right. And then Jesus also going about the withered fig tree 
and things of that nature. Jesus reminding us to always have that faith, strong faith. Amen. And he says that whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. It's very important, man, because I speak for myself, too, and anybody listening, man. We cannot hold grudges, man, while we're praying. We cannot walk around with that resentment and bitterness while we're praying to God for things. Because if you don't forgive others, God will shut out what you're praying for. So stop having offenses against people and hold the stuff towards them, man. got to let it go, people. Let it go. Let go and let God. Okay? Let it go, people. All right? And it goes more further in Mark 11 where... Jesus has been dealing with the Pharisees and what have you. He's just putting them in a place. <laughs> All right. So before we go into the book of Mark, chapter 12, I want to read this commentary that was included within these pages. OK, here we go. Brother at Penn, Luke, therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you. Most excellent. Theophilus, Luke chapter 1, verse 3. Good morning, Dr. Luke. You were instrumental in writing two of the New Testament books. Can you tell us about that? I'd be glad to. As I mentioned at the beginning of my gospel account, I tracked down many eyewitnesses and firsthand accounts about Jesus' life. Then I wrote a biography of Jesus in much the same way I would have recorded the case of one of my medical patients. I followed the same approach for Acts, only with that volume, I included many of my own observations and experiences. Everyone wants to know about Theophilus. Who was he? If you don't mind, I'll opt to leave that a mystery. I need only tell you that the name of Theophilus, Theophilus means friend of God. That also means that anyone who wants to be a friend of God can consider my books to be addressed to him or her. That gives us some idea of your audience and your method. But please tell us why you wrote one of Jesus' biographies as well as your biography of the early church. I like that biography of the early church. That second book was a condensation of my journal entries while I was traveling with the Apostle Paul, as well as material from other observations and interviews with early church leaders. I wrote the gospel as my own humble contribution alongside several other biographies of Jesus that were already available. I had wondered whether there were aspects of Jesus' life that had been left out of the others, it turns out I found several. Can you tell us about one of those? Well, imagine the experience of sitting down to talk with the mother of Jesus. Mary give Mary gave me some background on Jesus that she had. How did she put it? Treasured in her heart for decades. Her memories were sharp and priceless. It was such an honor to spend those hours with Jesus' mother. She had suffered such losses, and yet that frail woman's face was illuminated with joy as she spoke about her son's birth, death, and resurrection. She gave me a seamless outline of her son's life. We're all grateful you were able to record Mary's memories for generations of believers to come. Any last words for your audience, for our audience? I know that many of you have wondered why Acts ended so abruptly. That wasn't my plan, but now I think that was exactly the way God meant the book to end, essentially without an ending. The Acts of Jesus' followers were meant to go on, spreading the word and filling the word, filling the world with the gospel until Jesus returns. I trust your readers are doing just that. Back to the future. What would you want to know if you were able to ask Luke a question why? How important is the biography of Jesus to you? What can you do to develop a greater love for God's word? What events from your life as a follower of Jesus might be included in the modern acts of Jesus' disciples? Read Luke's story to appreciate Luke's contribution. Read his gospel and the book of Acts. All righty, all righty. So that is the reading commentary within the book of Mark chapter 11, just discussed in Luke. This was like an interview type, like question answer type of thing regarding the gospel and things of Jesus in that ancient time. All right. So this was a nice commentary. It gives you a perspective and a feel for like how would life be if you was there to ask all those questions and take account of those things, you know, so. It's always amazing to understand how things were in that time period and how it played out. But and this this goes into people who always wonder and question about the word of God and how it was written in the Bible and things of that nature. This is the thing. Like um, the New Testament is like letters and accounts and recordings. The Old Testament, plenty of things were uh, written through scrolls 
and, and things just pass down generation to generation because God's word is eternal. It's forever. So God's word doesn't just stay in one era of life. God's word is forever. And his angels, his prophets, his priests, his disciples, his people always pass down the word. Always. And always through inspiration. And it's also always through dreams and visions how God's word always just gets passed down. And man can take it and put it in a writing form and pass it on, you know. So the word of God kept passing through generation to generation. That's how powerful the word is. You know, people try to translate the Bible so much times and what have you. But no matter how much you reword it or translate it, the concept is still the same. I could still get the Ten Commandments. I could still get the gospel. I could still get the new covenant. I could still read the book of Revelation, you see. So um, don't get so hung up on like certain words or letterings that's a bit off or what have you misplaced. Don't get so hung up on that. Um, at the end of the day, we need to lo- know the Lord for ourselves. And we need to have that discernment and really be led by the Spirit when we go about things. Amen. So it's a very good commentary. Okay. Now, let us get into the book of Mark chapter 12. All right. Mark chapter 12. Here we go. The parable of the tenants. He then began to speak to them in a parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son, whom he loved, He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken of the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away, paying taxes to Caesar. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy, the hypocrisy, their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Marriage at the Resurrection. When the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with the question, Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection... Whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living You are badly mistaken. Mm. The greatest commandment. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. 
Well said, teacher. The man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all, un- with all your understanding, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Whose son is the Christ? While Jesus was teaching in the temple of courts, he asked, How is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls himself Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in marketplace in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows, houses, and for a show, make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Mm, 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 mm. The widow's offering. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Mm. That is the book of Mark chapter 12 reading right there. Very amazing read, very powerful right there. And it continues to go on about the parable of the tenants, marriage at the resurrection, the greatest commandment, also touches base on whose son is the Christ and the widow's offering. I love how she's, I love how Jesus said that. He said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. That's an amazing type of giving right there. Beyond cheerful giving, beyond everything, right? Give, 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 people, okay? What I'd like to do before I get to the book of Mark chapter 13, I would like to read the commentary that is included within these pages and continue further. So here we go. Today's Bible reading, the book of Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Recommended reading, the book of Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 56. The book of Mark, chapter 15, verses 33 through 41. The book of John, chapter 11, verses 25 through 26. Also the book of John, chapter 19, verses 28 through 37. And the title of this commentary is called Falling in Love. I remember the first time I had feelings for Jesus. It wasn't very long ago. I had gone to a conference on the coast with some Reed students, and a man spoke who was a professor at a local Bible college. He spoke mostly about the Bible, about how we should read the Bible. He was convincing. He seemed to have an emotional relationship with the book. Emotional relationship with the book. When we got back from the conference, I felt like my Bible was calling me. By the time I got to the end of Luke, to the part where they were going to kill him again, where they were going to stretch him out on the cross, something shifted within me. I remember it. It was cold outside, crisp, and the leaves in the trees of the park across the street were getting tired and dry. And I remember sitting at my desk, and I don't know how, I don't know how what it was that I read or what Jesus was doing in the book, but I felt a love for him rush through me, through my back, and into my chest. I started crying. I remember thinking that I could follow Jesus anywhere, that it didn't matter what he asked me to do. He could be mean to me. It didn't matter. I loved him, and I was going to follow him. I think the most important thing that happens within Christian spirituality is when a person falls in love with Jesus. I know our culture will sometimes understand a love for Jesus as weakness. There is this lie floating around that says I'm supposed to be able to do life alone without any help, without stopping to worship something bigger than myself. But I actually believe there is something bigger than me, and I need for there to be something bigger than me. I need someone to put awe inside me. I need to come second to someone who has everything figured out. If you haven't done it in a while, pray and talk to Jesus. Ask him to become real to you. Ask him to forgive you of self-addiction. 
ask him to put a song in your heart. Donald Miller. Things to take away from this commentary. When was the first time you experienced a love for Christ? How did this experience change you? How has your love for Christ grown? How has your love for Christ grown since you came to know him? How can you come to know him better and to love him more? Nice. Very great reading right there. Falling in love with Jesus. Being in love with the Lord. It's very powerful. Very powerful. You know, we got to really ha have that love, y'all. Have that love, you know. Was last, when was the first time you truly fell in love with the Lord and his son and the Holy Spirit and his word? When did you fall in love with all of it, right? Got to love all of that. You know what I mean? The love is what keeps us going. You know, this love is losing in this world, but let us keep them warm hearts, all right? Because we can't be like the rest of the world and heartless and all that. God loves us heavy, so we got to love him back and love others too, amen? Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the commentary within the book of Mark chapter 12. Now, let us go into the book of Mark chapter 13. Here we go. All right, Mark 13, signs of the end of the age. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given, given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have put them to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or into the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it would be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be the days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world. Until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would, would, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets, pro false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from, four wind, from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Mm. The day and hour unknown. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. 
Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Yes, yes. So that's the book of Mark chapter 13 reading. Just going through it, reviewing it is also discussing the signs of the end of age, the signs of the end of the age. So we're definitely seeing that more than ever today. All this prophecy is being fulfilled. Things are just popping off. All right. So the time is nigh, people. Let us tighten up. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So that's the book of Mark chapter 13 reading. Now let us go into the book of Mark chapter 14 reading, all right? The book of Mark chapter 14, here we go. Jesus anointed at Bethany. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying angrily, in an angry manner, to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you could help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Mm -hmm. Then Judas Iscariot, Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to, chief, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. The Lord's Supper. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was a customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent his two disciples, two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, say to the owner of the house he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Excuse me. The disciples left, went to the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve while they were reclining at the table, eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave, to his, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. You will fall. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted in a sense of even if I have to emphatically even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Gethsemane. 
They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to deeply be he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus arrested. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. The one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled, deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Before the Sanhedrin, they took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right to the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some, then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple, and in three days we'll build another, not made by man. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the one Christ? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. And some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fist and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Peter disowns Jesus. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also are with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them. You are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, he will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Wow, that is the book of Mark chapter 14 reading. It's always emotional and heavy when you read how how it led up to his death. Amen. The betrayal, the mockery, the harsh words, the abuse, all of that. It It always hits, you know, thinking about what he went through for our sins. All that he went through, just for our iniquities, our transgressions. He is beyond worthy. He is beyond able. Amen. 
Only he, only he's able to do that. Amen. So that's always a heavy part to read. And I just want to read this in commentary scripture within Mark 14. Mark 13, Mark chapter 13, verse 26. God will return with power. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Just wanted to read that commentary in scripture, okay? All right, all right. So before we get into the book of Mark chapter 15, I want to read this commentary that was placed in between these pages, and then we'll continue further, okay? Here we go. Today's Bible reading, Mark chapter 14, verses 43 through 65. Recommended reading, the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. Also the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 13. Yes, yes. And the title of this commentary is called Choosing God's Will. If you were to consider the desires, motives, thoughts, and actions of most Christians, I think you would discover that all grown believers want the same thing. They desire to live in the presence of God. They long to communicate Jesus Christ in a powerful way. And they seek daily spirit, spiritual renewal. The spiritual renewal we long for is a result of the life of Jesus at work within us, flowing through us day after day. We Christians have a treasure within us, nothing less than God himself. Paul says this marvelous treasure is contained in clay jars, our bodies. Our bodies are so fragile, we have to treat them with great care. Yet God has chosen to dwell within our humble and perfect human bodies, and our bodies dwell the power and the glory of the resurrected Christ. Yes, Paul explains when he says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 10. The death of Jesus must be at work in us before we can see the results of the life of Christ. But how does the death of Jesus work in us? What does this mean in our daily lives? Whenever we choose God's will over our own, the death of Jesus is at work in us. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus provided a perfect example of choosing God's will over our own. Jesus was the perfect man. He knew God's will for his life and wanted it. Nevertheless, Jesus wasn't a masochist, masochist who couldn't wait to be beaten and mocked, who couldn't wait for the nails to be pounded through his hands. Jesus prayed that he wouldn't have to drink such a bitter cup. But Jesus knew the will of the Father and chose God's will over his own. Not in resignation, resignation, but in a clear-cut, meaningful decision. Jesus' choice is an example to all, all of us. Whenever we choose God's will over ours, we are dying to ego, pride, passion, and desire. When we choose God's will over our own, we become Christ-conscious instead of self-conscious, and the life of Jesus begins to flow through us. God then can use us to bring life to others because he is having his way in our lives. Louis Palau. Things to take away from this commentary. Why did Jesus go to the cross? What does it mean for the death of Jesus to be at work in our lives? Are you fully submitted to the will of God? How does the example of Jesus impact the decisions you make? Mm, it's a very powerful commentary right there. Choosing God's will over our own will. Being Christ conscious instead of self-conscious. Powerful, 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 man. That really that, that really is it right there, man. When you kill your own ego, kill your pride, and kill your passion, desire, that's how God uses you better. And that's a daily battle with us, right? We all have our own little ego, pride, and passion, desire about things. But at the end of the day, we got to ask ourselves, is this really God's will? Always seek God's will, people. Always be Christ conscious, amen? Always, always, always. Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the commentary within the book of Mark 14 reading. Okay. Now we will get into the book of Mark chapter 15 reading. All right. The book of Mark chapter 15. Here we go. All right. Mark 15. Jesus before Pilate. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Pilate. Yes, it is, as you say, Jesus replied. 
The chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate, Pilate was still was amazed. Now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner from the people whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas, Barabbas was in prison with an exurrectionist who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them, crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers mocked Jesus. The soldiers led Jesus away to the palace that is the praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call him, call out to him, hail king of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they might, when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they laid him, then they led him out to crucify him. The crucifixion. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews, they crucified They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, the king of it, this king of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. The death of Jesus. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabashathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breath breathed his last breath. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard this cry and saw how he had died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. The burial of Jesus. It was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate, Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen clothes clothes, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Okay, that is the book of Mark chapter 15 reading. It goes more further to detail about the things Jesus endured, 
how he got mocked, how they made insults at him. They spit on him, disrespected him, blasphemed him, all that stuff. And it went out that way, all right? So what I would like to do before I get into the book of Mark chapter 16, I would like to um, read this commentary within the pages of Mark 15, okay? So here we go. Today's Bible reading, the book of Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 41. Recommended reading, the book of Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. The book of Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. The book of 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. The title of this commentary is called Saturday. Okay. Or Sabbath day, what have you. The author and preacher, Tony Campalo, delivers a stirring sermon adopted from an elderly black pastor at his church in Philadelphia. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming, is the title of the sermon. And once you know the title, you know the whole sermon. In the canvas that increases in tempo and in volume, Capallo contrasts how the world looked on Friday when the forces of evil won over the forces of good. When every friend and disciple fled in fear, when the Son of God died on the cross, with how it looked on Easter Sunday, the disciples who lived through both days, Friday and Sunday, never doubted God again. They had learned that when God seems most absent, he may be closest of all. When God looks most powerless, he may be most powerful. When God looks most dead, he may be coming back to life. They had learned never to count God out. Capallo skipped one day in his sermon, though. The other two days have earned names on the church calendar, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Yet in a real sense, we live on Saturday, the day with no name. What the disciples experienced in small scale, three days in grief over one man who had died on a cross. We now live through on, live through on a cosmic scale. Human history grinds on. Between the time of promise and fulfillment, can we trust that God can make something holy and beautiful and good out of a world that includes includes Bosnia and Rwanda and inner city ghettos and jammed prisons in the richest nation on, on the earth? It's Saturday on planet Earth. Will Sunday ever come? That dark Golgothan Friday can only be called good because of what happened on Easter Sunday, a day which gives a tantalizing clue to the riddle of the universe. Easter opened up a crack in the universe, winding down toward the entropy and decay, sealing the promise that someday God will enlarge the miracle of Easter to cosmic scale. It is a good thing to remember that in the cosmic drama, we live out our days on Saturday, the in-between day with no name. I know a woman whose grandmother lies buried under 150-year-old live oak trees in the cemetery of an Episcopal church in rural Louisiana. In accordance with the grandmother's instructions, only one word is carved on the tombstone, waiting, Philip Yancey. Things to take away from the commentary. What does it mean for you to live life on Saturday? How would your life be different if you knew that Sunday was only a day away? How can you begin to live your life in the light of eternity? So that's the commentary based around Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, with this commentary, it was a bit mixed with some kind of carnal uh, pagan views about uh, Easter and all that. As we know, the holidays of this Gregorian Roman calendar is uh, pagan and Babylonian, what have you. But in within culture, Christianity, what have you, they used um, Christ's death and mixed it with Easter and what have you, according to the days, times, and months. But you can't really do that because... Um, there aren't really too much accurate, exact dates and times of all this coming to pass and happening. So um, you can't really mix the word of God and the scriptures with pagan things. And that's what a lot of religions have done. And this is a clear example of it. So when I read these commentaries, just bear with me, y'all. But it's just commentaries within this um, scripture that I have, all right? But all in all, Christ dying for us and coming back three days is a powerful, eventful thing that stick with us to this day. And we should never lose sight of that, all right? God's promise is always important and powerful, okay? So always keep that in mind, all right? So that was the commentary of Mark 15 and the whole reading of it. Now, let us get into the book of Mark, chapter 16. All right, so here we go. 
The Resurrection When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after the sun rised, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark chapter 16, verse 9 through 20. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, hmm, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they, had, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them. While they were walking in the country, these returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them neither. Believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and they will drink deadly poison. It will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Yes, yes, y'all. So there you have it. That is the book of Mark chapter 16 reading. And that sums up all the book of Mark. Okay, the book of Mark has 16 chapters. So that was a pretty shortened chapter. Matthew had 28 chapters. Mark has 16 chapters. Okay. And this just discussed Jesus coming back. He is risen. He is alive. We serve one who lives. Amen. When God said he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he is a true living God. That is a fact, y'all. We serve a living God. These other nations and other people serve a dead God. We serve an alive one. Amen. We serve a living one. True living God. Amen. Son lives. Son is risen. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. You should be rejoicing right now. Embracing. He gave us life, y'all. Yes, yes. He gave us his love, his promises, his fulfillment, his son. Grace, mercy, anointing, blessing, power, healing, deliverance, repentance. He gave all of us that. Amen gave us another day to go at it y'all another day to get it amen gave us another day to keep seeking him and get closer to him hallelujah yes yes y'all beautiful reading right there okay so matthew and mark are similar the difference is that the book of matthew is a bit more longer and discussing more of the buildup of christ and also his bloodline the book of mark doesn't include his bloodline but it includes a bit more manuscripts and details about mary magdalene and Jesus, and it's throwing a few little tweaks to what Matthew already said. So Matthew and Mark were taking account of these things, okay? So there you have it. That is the reading right there, man. Very powerful, okay? Remember, y'all, we have to preach the good news to everybody, all four corners of the earth, amen? We have to, we have to, we have to, okay? The Great Commission, y'all, so there you have it, all right? What I would love to do as I close out is give all the praise, honor, and glory to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And praise is only begun, so die for our sins. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So here we go. Yes, yes, y'all. Hallelujah. Glory. Yes, yes, y'all. All praise and glory to him. He is the hope for humanity. Amen. Yes, yes. He is the Adam, the second Adam, the last Adam, the advocate, the almighty, true and living God, the Alpha and Omega. Amen. He is the apostle of our profession. 
the arm of the Lord, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the author and finisher of our faith, the author and perfecter of our faith, the author of life, the author of salvation, the beginning and the end, the beginning of creation of God, the beloved son, the blessed and only potent, the blessed and only ruler, the branch, the bread of God, the bread of life, the bridegroom, the capstone, the captain of salvation, the chief cornerstone, the chief shepherd, the Christ, the Christ of God, excuse me, the constellation of Israel, the cornerstone, the counselor, wonderful counselor, the creator, the day spring, the deliverer, the desire of the nations, the door, the elect of God, Emmanuel, the eternal life, the everlasting father, the faith and true witness, faithful and true, the faithful witness, the first and the last, the first begotten, the first born from the dead, first born over all creation, the forerunner, the gate, the glory of the Lord, God, the good shepherd, the great high priest, the great shepherd, the head of the church, the heir of all things, the high priest, holy and true, the holy one, the hope, the hope of glory, the horn of salvation, the I am, the I am that I am, the image of God, Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the judge of Israel, the judge, king eternal. He is the king of Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. He is the king of kings. Hosanna, Hosanna. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. King of saints, king of the ages, king of the Jews, the king, the lamb, the lamb of God, the lamb without blemish, the last Adam, the lawgiver, the leader and commander, the life, the lie of the world, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the living one, the living stone, the Lord, the Lord is my banner, the Lord is my rock, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is my strength, the Lord is my healer, the Lord is my redeemer, the Lord is my deliverer, the Lord is my fortress, the Lord is my strength, everything and above, the Lord, our righteousness, the Lord of all. Yes, yes, he is the Lord. Yes, yes, the Lord, our God is one. Yes, yes, Yahuwah, Yeshua, Yahamashiach, Barakatha, Shalom, Shalom. Yes, yes, Elohim. Yes, the consuming fire. Yes, yes, Yehosha, Yehusha, Yahawashai. He is all of that. Amen. The consuming fire. Yes, yes, the name above all names. The government rests on his shoulders. Hallelujah. All praises to the God of heaven and earth. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, yes, y'all. His son sits at the right hand of him. Yes, yes, the Lord sits between cherubims. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. He is by the two witnesses. It's between the two witnesses. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Glory to the most high God. Yes, yes. All praises to him, y'all. He is the consuming fire. He definitely is, y'all. He is a merciful God, a gracious God. He is slow to anger. Hallelujah. Yes, he is. He is he is slow to anger. Very merciful one we, we, we serve. Yes, yes, he is. He is the father of lights, the father of the fatherless, the father of widows, the father of the father of mercies. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Hallelujah. Yes, he is the God of heaven, y'all. Made everything, all of his handiwork. Amen. The Lord of all, the Lord of glory, the Lord of lords, the man from heaven, the man of sorrows. The great physician can heal all things. The carpenter can fix all things. That is too hard for the Lord. With God, all things are possible. Amen. Yes. The man from heaven, the man of sorrows, the mediator of the new covenant, the mediator, the messenger of the covenant, the Messiah, the mighty God, the mighty one, the morning star, the Nazarene, the offspring of David, the only begotten son of God, our great God and savior, our holiness, our spiritual husband, our Passover, our protection, our redemption, our righteousness, our sacrificed Passover lamb. The power of God, the precious cornerstone, the prince of kings, the prince of life, the prince of peace, the prophet, the redeemer, the resurrection of life, the resurrector. He is the life. Hallelujah. The revelation, the revelator, the righteous branch, the righteous one, the radiant one, the perfect example, the rock, the root of David, the rose of Sharon, the ruler of God's creation, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the savior, the seed of woman, the shepherd, the bishop of souls, the Shiloh, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of God, the son of man, the son of the blessed. Son of the Most High God, the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The Son of Righteousness, the Just One, the One Mediator, the Stone the Builders Rejected, the True Bread, the True God, the True Light, the True Vine. He is the truth. Hallelujah. He is the way. Amen. He is the life. Hallelujah. He is the way, truth, and life, y'all. The Wisdom of God, the Witness, the Wonderful Counselor, the Word, the Word of God, the Word of Yahuwah, the Word of Elohim, the Word of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yahusha, the Word, Ahayashaya. Yes, yes, Yeshua. He is the true word. We touch and agree. Amen. Yes, yes. We serve an awesome creator. And this son is amazing for dying for our sins. We touch and agree, y'all. Praise the Lord. Glorify his name. Exalt his name. Lift his name on high, y'all. Boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord, y'all. We serve an amazing one. We serve a true one. Hallelujah. We serve a true and living one. Amen. We know who we serve. Amen. Yes, yes, his son is too awesome for us. His son is just way too amazing. 
He shed his blood for our sins, our transgressions, our iniquities. His blood cleaned up our mess. Hallelujah. Let's get it together, family. His son is so amazing. Proclaim and boast in the Lord. Proclaim who he is among everybody. All four corners of his son is awesome. He is the seed of Abraham promise, seed of Adam humanity, seed of David kingship, seed of God deity, seed of Jacob nationality, seed of Judah tribe, seed of Shem race, seed of woman prophecy. Yes, yes, amen. In the authority and the power name of Jesus Christ, you are healed, renewed, restored, redeemed, forgiven, embraced, loved, new creature of Christ, born again, forgiven, delivered, renewal, transformation, new mind, new heart, new soul, new hands to prosper, new footsteps, new path, new solutions, new ideas, new mind, new habits, new routines, new life, new seasons, new opportunities, new open doors, new blessings, new levels, steadfast, stability, faith, love, prosperity, joy, merry heart. I speak those things over your life. Double portion, triple, double, triple, triple portion. I almost said triple, double. Hallelujah. Woo. Double portion, y'all. Abundance. I speak those over your life. Amen. A hundredfold, eternal life. I speak those things over your life, y'all. Let us hear the well done, my servant, when it's all said and done, y'all. Get your names on the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, y'all. Get the crowns. Get your treasures in heaven, the crown of life, everything and more. Amen. Everlasting life, eternal life, everlasting joy. Amen. Let's get together, y'all. Let's get together, family. Yes, yes. All right. That is the word for today. The whole book of Mark reading. Okay. All 16 chapters. Make sure you always read the word for yourself and know the Lord and get those encounters with the Lord, man. Stay in his word. Stay in line. Be a doer of the word, man. The great commission, everything. Amen. God spread this gospel to everybody, man. All four corners. Every, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Got to stay strong for the Lord, people. Got to hang in there, man. There's so much things that are distracting people and throwing people off. Boy, we got to stay focused on the Lord. We cannot be sidetracked or distracted or caught up in nonsense and foolishness and war against flesh. Is this, man, we, don't, we don't fight against flesh, man. Stop getting so caught up in flesh and emotions and people and this and that and the other and your family member and your friend and your coworker and this, your neighbor and all that. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, people. We're going against principalities of the air, y'all. Go against wickedness of high places, okay? Got to understand that, man. Keep on the armor of God, people. Keep on the armor of God. The, the word is your sword. That's your weapon. That double-edged sword is your weapon. You got to go slay with that one. All right? Got to keep the armor of God on you, y'all. Got to stay strong. Got to stay strong, people. Amen? We touch and agree, so there you have it, all right? I pray to God that whoever listens, man, I pray that you repent and get baptized and start your life over for the most high. I pray that you stop backsliding and turn from your ways and you stay on that narrow path. You keep fighting the good fight of faith. You keep your eyes on the prize. All the goodness of God, I pray that the Lord showers you with his blessings, his light, his power, his love, his fire. I pray that you get purified in him. I pray that he refines you and he molds you into a new creature in Christ. And you just keep walking by faith, people. You stay obedient. You stay faithful in alignment. And you help others along the way as well. All right? You hang in there, people. Hang in there. Amen. So... What I love to do as I close out is give y'all a priestly blessing on the way out. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. I'm Jarvis Kingston. I got much love for y'all. Praying for you all. Love you all. Let's keep our hands on the plow. Let's keep our feet on the enemy's neck. Amen. Touch and agree. Amen. Love you all. Peace. <laughs>